Hello everyone. My name is Deepa and I am PhD student here in AISC and I will be giving you examples how we use AI in the daily life. So how many of you have phones? Everyone, how many of you start the first thing in the morning? Just three? Is that a lie? <laughs> or everyone? Okay. I will tell you an example how we use it every day. Every day, AI helps people with their personal lives, jobs, transportation, education, health. It's not great. I'm not sure I understand. With their personal. Is that. Zoom. Yeah, it's not. Mm -hmm. I think it's because. Zoom. Select from the. No, no, no. Select it from the. Mm -hmm. It is not showing me the speaker's name. Yeah, it doesn't show it automatically goes there. Can you pause? Okay. Health and more, maybe even without them realizing it. Here are some examples of AI in action on a typical day. In the morning, a teenager wakes up and uses facial recognition to unlock her phone. She scrolls through social media feeds to see what's new. Then she asks the voice assistant on her phone what the weather is going to be like that day so she knows how to dress for school. A college student uses an app on his phone to deposit a birthday check from his grandmother. He takes a photo of the check and the app automatically reads the handwriting to figure out the amount. It then deposits it into his account. Meanwhile, a younger student uses a different app that is teaching her a new language. The app listens to what she says and can recognize what she's saying, even if she makes mistakes. The app then gives her personalized feedback on her pronunciation. At the same time, a person gets in their car to go to work, and the navigation system plans the fastest route based on current traffic. In the car, they listen to a music streaming service, which already knows what types of songs they like based on what they listened to before. When a factory worker arrives at her job, she sees that, as usual, humans and robots are both assembling cars. The robots do some of the more dangerous or repetitive tasks, like welding or painting. AI helps the robots recognize the tools they need to pick up or check parts to make sure they have been cut exactly right. When the cars are completed, computers help manage inventory and plan efficient shipping routes to deliver them around the world. Now, meet a farmer who's checking on her crops. She notices that some of her plants look unhealthy. She pulls out her smartphone and uses an app to take a photo of the leaves. The app can detect crop disease and also identify harmful insects. The app identifies the problem and recommends treatment. A surgeon is using AI to help make a medical diagnosis for a patient, and then a robot helps her perform a successful surgery. Afterwards, she goes to visit patients in a nursing home where robots gently lift seniors in and out of bed and help them move around. In the meantime, a traveler needs to book a flight to another city. An automated customer service chatbot helps him book his ticket on the phone. Once he's on board, autopilot flies the plane for much of the flight. AI is even used in space. On the International Space Station, an astronaut talks to a free-floating robot that helps with chores and does jobs that are risky for humans. Now that you've learned about how other people use AI every day, think about how you use it. Spend a few minutes. Okay, so I want you all to spend a few minutes and just list all the apps or like you have seen the examples and tell me in what sense you use AI. Who wants to first go first? Yes. Yeah. 
Are you even like activating and also like the same thing like you said about the like what you should do, what you should do, but you you like me open and you outdoor outdoors outdoors and the closer to what you like and uh yeah. 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 Okay. okay, you know how to see where we are using AI nowadays, right? Okay. So uh, goals of AI is to make our lives better. AI can empower to handle like a lots of human tasks that can perform, um, that can increase the human productivity and help uh, to deal with the environment like hazard hazardous environment. Like you have seen the examples, like robots are helping in welding, welding and other tasks in the manufacturing uh, buildings. Uh, and also robot can take over all the dangerous jobs where we have to reduce the potential of accidents and injuries. Now, computers can handle all the repetitive and mundane tasks which human don't like to do. Like uh, if you give up to calculate something, like if you have to ask them to cal uh, calculate like five power 25. So that's a very mundane task. So AI can do that easily. Now, automatic these processes, we can free up the valuable time and our mental energy also. So which can be uh, used in other tasks uh, like imagine the possibility of uh, data entering, lengthy paperwork, and repetitive manual la labor. So there all we can use AI, okay? And we need to design, uh, design the environment where humans and machines can work together. We can create the world that can use technology, and then we can progress on improve our quality of life. That's why AI is very useful. Now. There are uh, topics in AI. Um, so these are the main topics which can encompass like the various as aspects of computer science. It involves intelligent machines that can perform the tasks that typically require human intelligence. And there are fascinating uh, aspects where all these things can be used. So uh, out of that search, like uh, this kid just, sorry, I don't, I don't remember the names, but yeah. So that uh, that uh, kid just told us that search is the important thing which we use. Then representing knowledge, as Dr. Shet have uh, told that data is very important in our daily life. Then planning, planning we use in the tasks like manufacturing, robotics, and Amazon use a lot of planning. We will show you the example how Amazon Amazon use AI there. Then machine learning. So behind all of these, machine learning is an important aspect that use that is being behind all of these things. Natural language processing, how doctors analyze their text. We have an example of that. Then expert systems, how doctors use the surgeries and use AI to do the surgeries. Then interacting with the environment like visions, games, and robotics. So let's talk about search. So how many of you use Google search? Everyone, have you ever thought how Google search works? Can can someone try to answer that? Yeah, that's true. So there are different ways we can search. Uh, we might want to find a way that that is suitable us and satisfy our goal. So it's like finding the first puzzle of pieces, and even it's if it's the be best fit in that puzzle or not. And we might to keep searching until we find our absolute uh, solution of our question. Now it's it's like carefully examining each puzzle pieces until we 
don't fit that puzzle. So search just like that. Let's see how Google search works. Every day, billions of people come here with questions about all kinds of things. Sometimes we even get questions about Google search itself, like how this whole thing actually works. And while this is a subject entire books have been written about, there's a good chance you're in the market for something a little more concise. So let's say it's getting close to dinner and you want a recipe for lasagna. You've probably seen this before, but let's go a little deeper. Since the beginning, back when the homepage looked like this, Google has been continuously mapping the web, hundreds of billions of pages, to create something called an index. Think of it as the giant library you look through whenever you do a search for lasagna or anything else. Now, the word lasagna shows up a lot on the web, pages about the history of lasagna, articles by scientists whose last name happened to be lasagna, stuff other people might be looking for. But if you're hungry, randomly clicking through millions of links is no fun. This is where Google's ranking algorithms come into play. First, they try to understand what you're looking for, so they can be helpful even if you don't know exactly the right words to use or if your spelling is a little off. Then they sift through millions of possible matches in the index and automatically assemble a page that tries to put the most relevant information up top for you to choose from. Okay, now we have some results. But how did the algorithms actually decide what made it onto the first page? There are hundreds of factors that go into ranking search results, so let's talk about a few of them. You may already know that pages containing the words you search for are more likely to end up at the top. No surprise there. But the location of those words, like in the page's title or in an image's caption, those are factors too. There's a lot more to ranking than just words. Back when Google got started, we looked at how pages link to each other to better understand what pages were about and how important and trustworthy they seemed. Today, linking is still an important factor. Another factor is location, where a search happens. Because if you happen to be in Ormea, Italy, you might be looking for information about their annual lasagna festival. But if you're in Omaha, Nebraska, you probably aren't. When a web page is uploaded is an important factor too. Pages published more recently often have more accurate information, especially in the case of a rapidly developing news story. Of course, not every site in the web is trying to be helpful. Just like with robocalls on your phone or spam in your email, there are a lot of sites that only exist to scam, and every day scammers upload millions more of them. So just because instantvirusdownload.net lists the words lasagna recipe 400 times, that doesn't mean it's going to help you make dinner. We spend a lot of time trying to stay one step ahead of tricks like these, making sure our algorithms can recognize scam sites and flag them before they make it to your search results page. So let's review. Billions of times a day, whenever someone searches for lasagna or resume writing tips or how to swaddle a baby or anything else, Google software locates all the potentially relevant results on the web, removes all the spam, and ranks them based on hundreds of factors like keywords, links, location, and freshness. Okay, good time to take a breath. This last part is about how we make changes to search, and it's important. Since 1998, when Google went online, people seem to have found our results pretty helpful. But the web is always changing, and people are always searching for new things. In fact, one in every seven searches is for something that's never been typed into the search box before by anyone ever. So we're always working on updates to search, thousands every year. Which brings up a big question. How do we decide whether a change is making search more helpful? Well, one of the ways we evaluate potential updates to search is by asking people like you. Every day, thousands of search quality raters look at samples of search results side by side, then give feedback about the relevance and reliability of the information. To make sure those evaluations are consistent, the raters follow a list of search quality evaluator guidelines. Think of them as our publicly available guide to what makes a good result good. Oh, and one last thing to remember. We use responses from raters to evaluate changes, but they don't directly impact how search results are ranked. So there you have it. Every time you click search, our algorithms are analyzing the meaning of the words in your search, matching them to the content on the web, understanding what content is most likely to be helpful and reliable, and then automatically putting it all together in a neatly organized page designed to get you the info you need. All in, oh, 0.81 seconds. Wow. Anyone else ready for dinner?
Interested in learning more? We've got a whole website dedicated to how search works. So you can go into the Google website and these links will be provided to you if you want to learn more. But isn't it interesting to learn about search? You use it in your daily life, right? How many of you use it for doing your homeworks? Oh, all of them. Nice. Does it help? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So another aspect is that knowledge representation. Now it is very important how we represent the knowledge in uh, AI and the specific domain and format, all, all of the, these things are very important in uh, AI. So some of the basic uh, components in knowledge representation are like logics, rules, semantic net, frame and script. So I will show you the example of all of them. So I just wanted to share with you a basic intuition um, um, so, uh, you know, even our human brain, um, there are, um, there's a lot of data coming to our, um, senses. Um, there's one estimate that says that our brain is bombarded with 11 million, uh, bits per second. Um, and in some things that, that we work on, we take immediate decision. Uh, you know, uh, it's called perception. So if, um, uh, a object is coming to your face, you immediately will duck. You won't be thinking really about it. You won't be saying, oh, should I duck or not? You'll duck it. Right? Um, uh, and so um, that kind of processing is called uh, system one processing, uh, fast processing. And um, it's also where um, program is ready to take the data and immediately make a decision. So when we do statistical processing, when you, when you use uh, mathematics and stats to uh, take data and process it, uh, so typically, you know, the programs like machine learning, deep learning, they, they work very fast. So the, to train them, it takes time, right? Uh, you know, how you act given a data, that takes a lot of time. That is what training in machine learning is about. But to use it to make the decision at the runtime, it's instantaneous, right? Um, however, um, there is some other uh, kind of processing that we do, our brain does, uh, which is called slow processing, thinking fast, thinking slow. So there is a, a Nobel uh, Prize that was given to the behavioral economist called Daniel Kahneman. And he came up with this theory. And then a lot of uh, neuroscientists and cognitive scientists have adapted that. And that's where uh, we also work with IBM on a collaboration in this area. So there you will do deliberate thinking. That means uh, you are getting some signal like sensory signals, thinking, and you want to think for a time, you're going to mull over it, and then you're going to decide. You're constantly, some of you who are here are constantly thinking, um, you know, uh, do I like AI? Is this what I want to do in future? It's not ha happening in just one instance, right? So that is uh, slower processing. Now, um, a lot of things uh, that our brain does um, is, uh, 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 affected by our knowledge and experiences that we already have, right? So um, uh, take the same data, but you give it to two different persons with a different expertise and different knowledge in the domain. Clearly the results will be different, right? The same is here, that you're going to have, um, uh, if you want to use knowledge, when you are doing processing, in AI processing, then you need that knowledge representation. Just as, so that kind of human knowledge that we have is captured and put into this representation that Deepa is talking about, which then is used along with other uh, AI techniques, symbolic AI techniques, we call it machine learning, uh, uh, is not symbolic, sorry, um, uh, the, the rule-based techniques and others, that uh, uh, I, I meant to say statistical, right here, the statistical one that, you know, machine learning based, that uh, knowledge will improve what machine learning techniques can do. And that's why this, part is very interesting and important. Okay. So lo logic-based representations are lo uh, formal rules, rules like uh, relationship, conditions, and constraints that help AI system make uh, decisions and to draw conclusions. 
uh, let us take an example that we have Google Assistant. So how, uh, how many of you use Google Assistant or Siri? Siri? Okay, if you ask Siri that if it's raining outside and remind me taking an umbrella, what it will answer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, true. So how it works? So it works like that. It asks the weather updates continuously because it asks uh, the uh, location on in your system, like in your phone or wherever you are using in your laptop, anywhere. So Siri works in everything, laptop, phone. Yes. So I ask that if you ask Siri uh, whether it is raining or not, how it will respond. Oh, or Google Assistant, any, any. Yeah, it tracks location. It tracks location when you provide the access to the location. So it asks to the pop up window that when you will provide the uh, location information and then it just access your phone's location wherever you go. So it will check the weather condition over there. And if the weather condition is like uh, it's raining, then it will remind you to take an umbrella or not. So that is like applying a logical rule waves if you can remind whenever it detects rain. It works like how our brain system works, right? So if we see outside that it is raining or not, then we will decide like if we want to take an umbrella or not. So th that works like that. Now in the rules, uh, we have conditions and actions. They provide guidelines for decision making. Now this example is, is for the Google Calendar. Now it's, uh, it's a SMS reminder for Google Calendar, which you can use. It's a very good application that reminds all of your classes. If you, if you forgot that you have a class on weekend, so you can just ask this application that remind me an appointment that by text. So it will remind you by text by sending and follow up message on your phone number. And it, it uses the rules that calendar has an appointment information. Then the rules guides the assistant to describe and to provide a specific information. And then uh, you can just see it on your messages. So uh, semantic net that represent the uh, knowledge is into like interconnected nodes and links. So how this works is like, uh, we have a lot of documents over net, internet all over. And if we ask that, tell me the capital of France. So uh, it will just search all the connected nodes and it will just search all, all the other things which is linked to that. And then it will give the answer that uh, France capital is Paris. and uh, anything you can ask, like it will provide you the answer. And if you ask a math question also, it will give you an answer by calculating it, like what is two into four or what is four into six, right? And frames. So frames is like object or concept uh, in organizing all the attributes, attribute values and associated with that concept. And each frame contains information of character properties and behaviors. So this is an example. I was doing a Google search last night and I asked that just find a restaurant near me. So if you see the location, that's where we are right now. And it will just here, here we are right now. And it, it just find me the close by restaurant in near me. So how it did work, it worked like it first collects our information of location. After location, it just linked it to the uh, nearby restaurants and it just giving us the uh, list of restaurants which are nearby and it also shows that which of them are closed and which of them are open. So this is how uh, frames represent in the knowledge representation. This is another concept of scripts and uh, Google come up with this uh, 
very new technology that you can design your like you can um you can ask the google assistant to book your flight tickets your hotel tickets by sending just a message and it will just uh collect all your information of the credit card that is saved into your phone and it will just book a ticket for you so scripts capture all the events that are in sequence like I want to do this right now and do that night, th that after that. So it will just plan and just give you a trip details. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay. So we'll move forward. So now planning. So planning is like generating a sequence of actions to uh, reach a specific goal. And it it uh, it it is all depends on all the plans like logic, rules, frames, and scripts. We have to use planning in various applications like robotics, autonomic vehicles, logistics, schedule, and also game playing. So, how many of you play games? And there are like uh, uh, instances in which you try to shoot someone and you are not able to, right? I don't know the specific games because I'm not a game player, but yeah, I know that how games works. So it just uh, saves the logics in there. Like if you want to turn right or, or if you want to turn left, if you turn right, you will show, it will like show up with a, uh, with a character which will try to shoot you down, right? Who played games here? Can someone wants to explain? Yes. Any any game? Can game that person get answer? Can you can you answer for him? Yeah, that 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 we need to. You are talking about the unity part is new advancement or something like. You mean yeah? So I saw they they have made like two major applications like for if you know unity that is used for game development and creating them that is used for game development. There you can hack your own game. You need people to know like you need to understand the software, but it's a close procedural thing. You you just copy the scene and extend it from it. Like let's say you have a, a forest in Azure and you want to add trees, you want to add mountains to it as your game plays you. It can be done in Azure. And that you need to I think there will be session for games. Yeah, there will be a session in which you will learn how to do the Rubik cubes and uh, chess. I guess so. You will learn about that. But yeah, all these things need planning, need rules, need logics, and all of the things which we saw in the earlier slides. Now these are some of the application. How many of have heard about Tesla? Everyone? And do you want to buy Tesla? Guys, you have to answer. Are you fascinated about how it works? So it works all about AI. Like it uses AI to detect pedestrians, it uses AI to detect your roots, it uses AI to take a seat. It is, it is like autonomous driving, right? To see where to turn, where to stop, everything. So let's see a very quick example of how Amazon uses planning. Hi, I'm Jess McKenna, and I'm a TPM at Amazon Robotics. I've been working here for about two years now, and I work on our item manipulation team. One of the things I love most about my job is that I get to work with really interesting people on really challenging problems every single day. 
At Amazon Robotics, we simplify logistics for Amazon and delight our customers by creating robotic innovations that work in symphony with our employees to get packages onto our customers' doorsteps. Today, our fleet of over 520,000 mobile robots help our employees to fill the majority of our orders around the world. We're excited about one of our newest robots called Pegasus. This fleet of sortation robots is growing every year to make sure our customers get exactly what they ordered. But we can do more. Since 2015, Amazon has been pushing the state of the art in hardware and software for robotic material handling. We conduct fundamental research and take it all the way to scale the production. We learn from our systems in production and use that knowledge to improve our solutions. In addition to our internal teams, we collaborate with top researchers from across the globe. We are always looking around corners for new innovations to help our employees, continually improving safety in our facilities, and satisfying our customers. We've already shown the world our first robotic index station, or as we call it, Robin. Our peak season between the holidays and the new year gives our robotic capability the chance to shine. Today, we have tons of Robin stations working to sort millions of packages. This year, we'll be expanding that number to thousands of Robin stations in our facilities to sort over 2 million packages a day. At Amazon Robotics, we believe that tackling the world's most difficult challenges in robotics is the most interesting and rewarding work that we can do. Come join our diverse team of engineers, scientists, and program managers, and be part of something great with us, where you can see your imagination come to life. So how many of you use Amazon? All of the, nice. Have you ever think about that? How does it work? Now you know, how does it work, right? So if you, next time, if you order something online, you have to, you, you know, like how Amazon works. When you add anything into the cart, from cart, you put your address, then use the credit card details. All this is AI. So you are using AI every day. Okay. Any questions so far? And you are going to see some of the parts in the manufacturing visit. We have this uh, manufacturing in, uh, a collaboration in which Chaturangi will guide you there that how they are using AI. So she's sitting over last there and she will tell you more about manufacturing at that time. Okay. Expert systems. So how many of you have visited doctors who are using tools? Have you been to dentists who look through your teeth and check it, right? So all that is AI. When, when you see a camera, like when they put anything in your mouth and they see on the screen, it's just all set it up by a camera. Then it detects if there is an anomaly or if the tooth is getting decayed or not. So that that is being like examined by that camera and then camera just click an image if that camera will found anything bad in your teeth. And this is this this is a very uh, surgeric uh, example of expert system, like how doctors like neurosurgeons use uh, AI. So what they use is like this is the setup like they try to see into the into the brain for the surgery and they put a camera inside the brain and they try to see that if the nerve is damaged or not. If the nerve is damaged, then they will cut out that nerve and then they, they will do the surgery in the neurology. I cannot put the videos here because that will be too terrifying to put it here. Okay, so another field is natural language processing. Now, natural language processing is to understand the text and generate interpret and generate the new language in a way that is useful for everyone. Now, chat GPT. Chat GPT use natural language processing it behind it. Like it develops the, uh, it generates the word, what you want, it, it rephrases it, it uses all the text with it, it trains it, and then it uh, uh, generate whole new set of things, which you will be seeing in the next session, like how to generate your essays for schools. But let us see how doctors use natural language processing. Extract knowledge from medical records, call center conversations, medical voice sound bites, medical forms, regulatory filings, research reports, insurance claims, pharmaceutical documentation, and more. 
This ultimately helps doctors and care teams get holistic views of their patients quickly, or health plans to see population trends for their members, or pharma to draw insights from drug development research. This is possible thanks to a field known as natural language processing, which is concerned with programming computers to process and analyze large bodies of human communication that can live in many different formats, such as written text, spoken utterances, or even official documentation. And so in this episode, we will share how organizations can use one of Google's natural language services to specifically help process structured and unstructured healthcare language data using NLP, which stands for natural language processing. The Healthcare Natural Language API contains four key features that help you find, assess, and link knowledge in your data in the following ways. For one, it has the ability to map text to medical concepts, which is referred to as knowledge extraction. It also identifies and connects related medical attributes, which is known as relation extraction. It can also assess surrounding factors that could be clinically relevant, known as context assessment, and standardizes medical concepts so they can be analyzed across systems known as knowledge linking. Another way of thinking about NLP is that they can extract critical clinical information like medications, medical conditions, as well as understand contexts like negation, such as this patient does not have diabetes. It also understands temporality, such as this patient will start chemotherapy tomorrow and even infer there are relationships between things such as side effects or medication dosage. And what's most notable is we have a long list of ontologies the natural language models are trained with. Two notable ones are the ICD, which is used to code and classify morbidity data from inpatients and outpatient records, physician offices, and most national center for health statistics surveys. There's also SNOMED clinical terms, which provides poor terminology of electronic health records. The models also include US official codes for insurance procedures and RX norm, which contains a list of all medications available. Technical practitioners can leverage healthcare NLP to build apps for their own organization or for their entire industry, such as enabling precise search and discoverability across patient populations enable exchange of digital healthcare information and avoid processing delays, establish and maintain regulatory compliance, or automate administrative workflows, such as identifying and eliminating errors that require corrective activities. Anyone who has science-based texts around research or clinical data can get value from our healthcare NLP API. Here are a few sectors that can benefit to name a few. In telehealth, you now have off-the-shelf support for exchanging medical knowledge captured in written form and can extract structured knowledge from text and make it available for digital services such as chatbots, call centers, clinical decision support systems. This also frees up time by triaging patient calls and resolving cases that do not require the intervention of a clinical professional. Pharmaceutical researchers are also enabled via a standard patient discovery interface for population health and R&D applications since papers and clinical trial documentation can be surfaced to match patients or find novel treatments. Those managing clinical trials can both increase their number of participants as well as process the high volume of feedback and decrease time to government approval. Users who manage billing, especially in insurance companies, can have even better integration with claims payment or automate billing and coding for insurance. You can enable the healthcare NLP from your Google Cloud Projects UI or via the command line. If you do not have a project, there's a link in the description along with other helpful resources. And once you have set up permissions, you can begin using its context-aware models to extract medical entities, relations, and contextual attributes. Each text entity is extracted into a medical dictionary entry. To extract medical text, make a post request and specify the following information in the request. First, the name of the parent service, including the project ID and location. Also, the target text. The maximum size is 10,000 Unicode characters at this time. Let's quickly show you how you can leverage the Natural Language Healthcare API. 
We built a demo application with a JavaScript front end to visually understand the output of the Healthcare NLP API. Let's test out the sample medical record for a hospital patient. We sent over the sample medical test to the API on the back end, and we rendered the JSON response in the score back. In the first panel down here, we can see the various entities extracted and the corresponding medical code. Next, we can see their diagnoses with their corresponding confidence scores. Now, looking at the relationships between the entities, we can actually group together important attributes. For example, take a look at how long and how much of these medications are taken or were prescribed. There are so many possibilities when using healthcare NLP and especially when you pair it with Google services such as Dialogflow AI for a chatbot interface. You can even build custom models to build low-code apps using IOML entity extraction for healthcare so that users can simply upload documents and then perform manual annotations to train and build a model on what they would like to extract. This can then be integrated into larger data pipelines. You can also use Document AI to process fax documents or enable enterprise search for life science organizations using the Google Knowledge Graph. To learn more about the Healthcare Natural Language API, you can visit cloud.google.com, healthcare, docs, concepts, NLP. And thanks to machine learning, we can extract knowledge from medical records. Okay. So you have all seen how Google is so important in every field, right? And you use Google every day right now. There are some other examples of AI, like how to interact with the environment. And uh, this, this involves all the robotics, like decision-making process and learn from the experience that is called reinforcement learning. So I will show you some examples, like in environment where we are using um, all these things right now. So this is a computer vision application, like pedestrian detection. This is a camera set up in a university, and now they are detecting like what is the uh, what is the time when there are maximum number of uh, pedestrians walking, so that they can uh, block the traffic flow at that time. This is the one application in which camera is being set it up on the top, and then they are just detecting all these pedestrian walking, and it will analyze all the things, and then it will give the time frame from starting of the 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., let's say, then you have to block the traffic at that time. Now we use computer vision in many applications like image analysis and enhancement. So how many of you use uh, uh, image, like image uh, character or tools like that? Yeah, filters, Snapchat, Instagram. Just two? People don't use Instagram here? Snapchat? No? Okay. So in that, you see the application of AI also. When you just swipe the filters and change it, you put some bunny faces, you put a tongue in front of your faces. It just detect your face and then just filter it out with the filter what you want. So this is image quality resolution. Uh, than in games. So this is a very funny video. I will let you see it. So just to give you the con context, uh, this, uh, this is Albert. Albert is trying to walk and we will see how Albert uh, learns to walk. Thank you. 
Okay, so do you understand anything here? Can someone try to answer it? Yeah, it's learning. So when a kid is growing, kids also try to like a small baby when it tries to start walking. So it falls, 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 falls. It falls such many times, but eventually that baby starts walking, right? And that is how AI also learns. Like it will fall a lot of time, but it will learn from and retrain, retrain it, its its algorithm and it will learn how to like walk. This is an example just related to like how baby starts walking, right? And how many of you know about Gary Kaprosova? Kaprosova, sorry. Just one. Ka do, do you want to tell everyone who is he? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So in 2006, uh, I guess, right? Yeah. So around that time, uh, Gary Kasparova got beaten by the AI chess and it made him so sad that he was still trying to beat AI, but he couldn't and it failed. Like he, he failed to beat AI at that time. And I will tell you the examples of how robotics works. So this is 10 years ago. So this example was from DARPA and at that time, 10 years ago, they were trying to make robots to do all the normal things like we human do, like open the gate and then follow from that gate and help others and do the collaboration with other robots. But they did fail at that time. But now in 2023, we have Boston Dynamics robots and that can collaborate with each other. Like this robot don't have any arm to open the gate but it is looking through the gate and he will that robot will uh, direct to the other robot who have the gate So do you see now how robots can work with help of AI? Is it interesting? Are you excited to then visit the manufacturing visit on Wednesday?
I will show you some more examples. Yeah, yeah, I am uh, just opening up an example of how AI do in game and how it learns. So I'm giving them an exercise. Just to exit this thing and uh, re refresh this link. Okay. So just one more video before that. And uh, I, we, we have an exercise for you guys then. And complex. It all started billions of years ago, where small organisms developed a mutation that made them sensitive to light. Fast forward to today, and there's an abundance of life on the planet, which all have very similar visual systems. They include eyes for capturing light, receptors in the brain for accessing it, and a visual cortex for processing it. Genetically engineered and balanced pieces of a system, which help us do things as simple as appreciating a sunrise. But this is really just the beginning. In the past 30 years, we've made even more strides to extending this amazing visual ability, not just to ourselves, but to machines as well. The first type of photographic camera was invented around 1816, where a small box called a piece of paper coated with silver chloride. When the shutter was open, the silver chloride would darken where it was exposed to light. Now, 200 years later, we have much more advanced versions of the system that can capture photos right into digital form. So we've been able to... Human vision is amazingly beautiful and complex. It all... So this is respect to the video of robots, which I showed you, like how it is able to detect the gate. And it will tell you like how uh, the computer vision works because there is an application of computer vision over there. So I just want to... Uh, let you know all guys like how what is the background processing and how much task it is to create robots like that the easy part understanding what's in the photo is much more difficult consider this picture my human brain can look at it and immediately know that it's a flower our brains are cheating since we've got a couple million years worth of evolutionary context to help immediately understand what this is but a computer doesn't have that same advantage to an algorithm, the image looks like this, just a massive array of integer values, which represent intensities across the color spectrum. There's no context here, just a massive pile of data. It turns out that the context is the crux of getting algorithms to understand image content in the same way that the human brain does. And to make this work, we use an algorithm very similar to how the human brain operates using machine learning. Machine learning allows us to effectively train the context for a data set so that an algorithm can understand what all those numbers in a specific organization actually represent. And what if we have images that are difficult for a human to classify? Can machine learning achieve better accuracy? For example, let's take a look at these images of sheepdogs and mops, where it's pretty hard even for us to differentiate between the two. With the machine learning model, we can take a bunch of images of sheepdogs and mops, and as long as we feed it enough data, it will eventually be able to properly tell the difference between the two. Computer vision is taking on increasingly complex challenges and is seeing accuracy that rivals humans performing the same image recognition task. But like humans, these models aren't perfect. They do sometimes make mistakes. The specific type of neural network that accomplishes this is called a convolutional neural network, or CNN. CNNs work by breaking an image down into smaller groups of pixels called a filter. Each filter is a matrix of pixels, and the network does a series of calculations on these pixels, comparing them against pixels in the specific patterns the network is looking for. In the first layer of a CNN, it is able to detect high-level patterns like rough edges and curves. As the network performs more convolutions, it can begin to identify specific objects like faces and animals. How does a CNN know what to look for, and if its prediction is accurate? This is done through a large amount of labeled training data. When the CNN starts, all of the filter values are randomized. As a result, its initial predictions make little sense. Each time the CNN makes a prediction against labeled data, it uses an error function to compare how close its prediction was to the image's actual label. Based on this error or loss function, the CNN updates its filter values and starts the process again. Ideally, each iteration performs with slightly more accuracy. What if instead of analyzing a single image, we want to analyze a video using machine learning? At its core, a video is just a series of image frames. 
To analyze a video, we can build on our CNN for image analysis. In still images, we can use CNNs to identify features, but when we move to video, things get more difficult since the items we're identifying might change over time. Or more likely, there's context between the video frames that's highly important to labeling. For example, if there's a picture of a half full cardboard box, we might wanna label it packing a box or unpacking a box, depending on the frames before and after it. This is where CNNs come up lacking. They can only take into account spatial features, the visual data in an image, but can't handle temporal or time features, how a frame is related to the one before it. To address this issue, we have to take the output of our CNN and feed it into another model, which can handle the temporal nature of our videos. This type of model is called a recurrent neural network or RNN. While a CNN treats groups of pixels independently, an RNN can retain information about what it's already processed and use that in its decision-making. RNNs can handle many types of input and output data. In this example of classifying videos, we train the RNN by passing in a sequence of frame descriptions, empty box, open box, closing box, and finally a label, packing. As the RNN processes each sequence, it uses a loss or error function to compare its predicted output with the correct label. Then it adjusts the weights and processes the sequence again until it achieves a higher accuracy. The challenge with these approaches to image and video models, however, is that the amount of data we need to truly mimic human vision is incredibly large. If we train our model to recognize this picture of a duck, as long as we're given this one picture with this lighting, color, angle, and shape, we can see that it's a duck. But if you change any of that, or even just rotate the duck, the algorithm might not understand what it is anymore. Now, this is the big picture problem. To get an algorithm to truly understand and recognize image content the way the human brain does, we need to feed it incredibly large amounts of data of millions of objects across thousands of angles, all annotated and properly defined. The problem is so big that if you're a small startup or a company lean on funding, there's just no resources available for you to do that. This is why technologies like Google Cloud Vision and video. So now I have a little exercise for you to understand all these concepts. Uh, let's see, you can play this game. Okay. So quick draw is also developed by Google and it allows you to uh, draw a picture of object or idea. And then this neural network, which you learned about right now, it will just guess that what drawings it represent. And from each drawing, it's ability, like if AI is doing well, what you are drawing, it will just guess. So you can try a uh, quick draw with google.com. So you have access to USC guest Wi Fi, I guess. All of you can see. Or otherwise, you can connect to AIC Transum. I can just put in the details of that. Anybody have trouble with that?
like you can see the password. Anyone wants to come here and want to try? I can put it here the quickly this link. Who want to volunteer? Anyone from students? Yeah, come on. Sorry, I couldn't guess it. Is it okay? Yeah, it's, it's just like, no, it's, is it? No. Oh, it's so slow. I see me. It's so slow. I see which phone. It's so slow. Or flip. Or shoe. Oh, I know. It's ceiling fan. Do you have a way to turn up the sensitivity? <laughs> it's in black. Oh. I see finger. Or animal migration. Or bear. I see tiger. Or raccoon. It's so slow. I see owl. I see black cat. I see rhinoceros. Oh, I know. It's cat. I see bench. Or swimming pool. Or sandwich. Or saw. I see bottle cat. I see key. Oh, I know. It's crocodile. I see paperclip. Or dumbbell. Or seesaw. Or trombone. I see clarinet. Oh, I know. It's mosquito. I see swiggle. Or bat. Or dolphin. Or shark. Oh, I know. It's rhinoceros. Okay. Awesome. Okay, let's see one more video. It's the last video there. That is hide and seek and AI. Let's see. Dear fellow scholars, this is Pumi, Papers with Karo Jona Ifahir. In this project, OpenAI built a hide and seek game for their AI agents to play. While we look at the exact rules here, I will note that the goal of the project was to pit two AI teams against each other and hopefully see some interesting emergent behaviors. And boy, did they do some crazy stuff. The coolest part is that the two teams compete against each other and whenever one team discovers a new strategy, the other one has to adapt kind of like an arms race situation, and it also resembles generative adversarial networks a little. 
and the results are magnificent and using weird. You'll see in a moment. These agents learn from previous experiences and to the surprise of no one, for the first few million rounds, you start out with pandemonium. Everyone just running around aimlessly. Without proper strategy and semi-random movements, the seekers are favored and hence win the majority of the games. Nothing to see here. Then, over time, the hiders learn to lock out the seekers by blocking the doors off with these boxes and started winning consistently. I think the coolest part about this is that the map was deliberately designed by the open AI scientists in a way that the hiders can only succeed through collaboration. They cannot win alone, and hence, they are forced to learn to work together, which they did quite well. But then, something happened. Did you notice this pointy, doorstop-shaped object? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Well, probably, and not only that, but about 10 million rounds later, the AI also discovered that it can be pushed near a wall and be used as a ramp, and ta-da, got him. The seeker started winning more again. So the ball is now back on the court of the hiders. Can you defend this? If so, how? Well, these resourceful little critters learned that since there is a little time at the start of the game when the seekers are frozen, apparently during this time they cannot see them, so why not just sneak out, steal the ramp, and lock it away from them? Absolutely incredible. Look at those happy eyes as they are carrying that ramp. And you think it all ends here? No, 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 not even close. It gets weirder, much weirder. When playing a different map, the seeker has noticed that it can use a ram to climb on the top of a box, and this happens. Do you think couch surfing is cool? Give me a break. This is box surfing. And the scientists were quite surprised by this move, as this was one of the first cases where the seeker AI seems to have broken the game. What happens here is that the physics system is coded in a way that they are able to move around by exerting force on themselves, but there is no additional check whether they are on the floor or not, because who in their right mind would think about that? As a result, something that shouldn't ever happen does happen here. And we are still not done yet. This paper just keeps on giving. A few hundred million rounds later, the hiders learned to separate all the rams from the boxes. Dear fellow scholars, this is proper box surfing defense. Then lock down the remaining tools and build a shelter. Note how well rehearsed and executed this strategy is. There is not a second of time left until the seekers take off. I also love this cheeky move where they set up the shelter right next to the seekers, and I almost feel like they are saying, yeah, see this here? There is not a single thing you can do about it. In a few isolated cases, other interesting behaviors also emerge. For instance, the hiders learn to exploit the physics system and just chuck the ramp away. After that, the seekers go, what? What just happened? But don't despair, and at this point, I would also recommend that you hold on to your papers because there was also a crazy case where a seeker also learned to abuse a similar physics issue and launch itself exactly onto the top of the hiders. Man, what a paper. This system can be extended and modded for many other tasks too, so expect to see more of these fun experiments in the future. We get to do this for a living, and we are even being paid for this. I can't believe it. In this series, my mission is to showcase beautiful work. So did you enjoy it? So you see now how we can use AI a lot, right? And you see in all the draw AI concepts that it is able to predict everything which you draw. So anyone have questions? Yeah, it, it's supposed to be random because you're not choosing whether they are uh, just testing it, but 
plus if you have to have a significant uh, change in it, you have to train like in the game for fun. So I'm just doing it for two reasons. So there's reason why you're there. Yeah. It's using it behind it, like a uh, contradicting algorithm, which is a pressurized bar of thought in the system. It's behind in the position. Thank you. And we will be ready for next. We just